So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Maria. And for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to walk you through a problem my team and I have been trying to solve a few months ago. So I'm going to take some time during my presentation explaining some key concepts that are part of the solutions. Just keep in mind that while I was working on this, I barely knew any of these concepts. So what I'm sharing with you today is my learning path. So let's get started. So again, my name is Maria. Um, I joined The Guardian two years ago as a graduate software developer. Ever since I changed teams three times, I was first part of the content API team, where I was first introduced to Scala and functional programming. Six months later, I left, and I joined the apps team, where I developed for our iOS app using Swift and Objective-C, but then decided to go back to my first love, Scala. Um, so I'm now part of the editorial tools team, where we develop the tools our journalists are using every day. So at The Guardian, we have this concept of content atoms. So content atoms are pieces of content that do not represent the page. Instead, they stand alone as individual elements. So content atoms are structured data. By using content atoms makes it easier for us to feed richly structured content, both in off-platform and our own tools. So let's, let's quickly look at an example. These are two different Guardian articles, but they both have something in common. They both have a content atom embedded. And in this case, it's pretty easy to spot. It's like the, the gray box you see at the end of each article. This one in particular is called the Q&A atom. Um, so the cool thing about using atoms is that they're reusable. They're very easy to embed in all the articles. And in case, let's say, you made a typo, you can just correct it once, and then you'll see it updated across all the, the articles. So we currently have around 10 types of atoms, and we are constantly being asked to support more types of atoms. But <laughs> Building a new tool every time an atom is born is not sustainable. It takes the team around two months to build a new atom, uh, a, new, a new tool for an atom. And we started to see the similarities. They're all built on Scala, Play Framework, and React, and they all use the same services and the same features. So at the beginning of this year, we decided to build a tool that will become the home of all the atoms, so a tool to rule them all. Um, so we called it Atom Workshop, and we decided to take all the time we needed to, to implement all the features. So we faced many challenges while building this new tool. But the one we're going to talk about today is building a generic API endpoint. So the motivation behind it was collaborative editing. Um, now imagine that somewhere in the world, someone is updating an atom. But without that knowledge, someone else is updating the same atom. So by just using the common update endpoint that just takes the whole object and shoves it in the database, there's a very high risk that the two people will override their changes. So what we can do instead is follow the database constantly for changes, and then when an edit is detected, just use an endpoint that updates that field in particular. So as you can see, the only information we have is the path to the field um, that's in the URL of the request, and then the new value that's coming in the body of the request. So the trivial way to do it is write an endpoint for each field, right? But that's just crazy, because we would have ended up with hundreds of endpoints. Just keep in mind that each atom is different from, from, from another. So the structure of an atom can range from, let's say, a couple of string fields to very complex lists and enums, you name it. So, and even if we decided to, to write an endpoint for each field, why not just take advantage of, of the technologies that are out there? So the first thing we looked at was color reflection, but it proved to be difficult to understand. And because of the nesting of our classes, it was hard to have all the information um, we needed at the right time. So, Plus, it was quite slow, even for the 10 lines of code we've written that no one else could understand. Um, and to be fair, we didn't fully understand it ourselves. So our conclusion was, you can probably do very cool stuff with scalar reflection, but it takes a long time to master. And it honestly looks scary, so we just moved on. Um, so as, as soon as we dropped reflection, someone mentioned Shapeless. So Shapeless is this very popular library for, programming, uh, for generic programming in Scala. 
So think about generic programming as programming with types you know nothing about. So Shapeless gives you the ability to convert from a concrete type to a generic representation. So this generic representation is, um, is an age list. Think about, so an age list is a list where the type of every element is statically known at compile time. Think of age list as tuples, but with head, tail, map, flat map, and all the other operations you usually have on lists plus others. So the main, um, the main usage for age lists is abstracting over arity. So by throwing away all the unimportant details, like the name of the case class, Shapeless makes it easier to focus on similarities between type types and implement generic code. Like in this example, we have two very similar case classes. They both have three fields. All the fields have the same types, string, int, and boolean. So by just using the uh, generic type class we have from Shapeless, we can generate both of them, co convert both of them to an age list that have the same type, which is pretty cool. So this was our first try at using Shapeless. So these are just some case classes that are just meant to copy the ones we use in production. Now, they might look a bit over-engineered, but that's because we are in using Thrift in production. Um, and these are, this is just an atom. And let's say we want to update the type, the, the field that's called atom type. So how can we do it? We first use the label generic from Shapeless to convert from our a concrete type atom to this generic age list. Now the difference between uh, the generic I've shown you on, on the previous slide and label generic is that this one um, gives you more information about the fields and you can use them later, like the name of the field. Now, we can then use this nice syntax to update the atom type field and it works fine. As you can see, we now get um, an updated value for, for the type. But what happens if we want to update a field that's nested? Well, we're going to face two issues. One is that you cannot pass a variable to the symbols constructor we have there because the magic happens at um, compile time. And second, because the field is nested, we don't have enough information about um, our field at this point. And I'm going to use this to, to show you why. So when I've created a generic representation from Atom, only the first layer below Atom has been converted to, to a generic representation. So at this point, we don't have one for Atom data, so we can't go deeper inside the tree. So I've written this code uh, in a Scala fiddle, so you have a link there. I'm going to share the slides if you want to play with this. Um, cool. So this did, didn't really work. So we tried something else. So we did some Googling, and we found this Stack Overflow question about converting case classes to nested maps. And we just started wondering, would this help us solve our problem? The top response on Stack Overflow was written by Travis Brown. Maybe you've heard of him. And it looked very complicated at first. So knowing very little about shapeless and type classes or <laughs> anything else he, he's been using, it just took us a while to understand the solution. But as after some thinking, we decided it'd be a good idea to take our case classes, write some magic to convert them to the these nested maps from string to any, um, and then write a recursive function to update the field we want, and then write some more magic to put it back in a case class. Now, this sounded very interesting, and because you don't really get to do something like that every day. Um, now, I'm going to show you how we did it. Um, I'm not taking full credit for the code. I've used Travis's solution, but built on top of that to provi provide um, support for more types. Also, I'm not going to show you how we're doing the update, because that's actually the easy part. It's just a recursive function. First, I'm going to um, take one minute to talk about type classes, because if you're a beginner, a beginner, maybe you're not very familiar with how they work. And if you're not a beginner, well, everybody could use um, a reminder once in a while. So the official. Um, definition for type classes is that they are tools used in functional programming to enable ad hoc polymorphism. But I see type classes as patterns used def to define new behavior for types. So what do you actually need to define a type class? You need a trait and then an abstract um, behavior method. Um, and then 
you, the only thing you have to do is um, define some implicits that implement that functionality for the types um, you have. So let's look at this very cat-friendly example. I hope you can see the code. Can you see? But yeah. Um, so in this case, our type class is called greetings, and it has uh, an abstract method called message. Um, and I've defined here uh, implicits for how to handle the human type class and the type, uh, sorry, the human case class and the cat uh, case class. And you can see it's not, it's not very difficult at all. Uh, I've then defined uh, an implicit class. That's just for convenience. You don't really have to do that if you don't want to. But um, in the example, you can see it works for the types it knows how to handle. But as soon as I'm trying to call it on a dog, for example, it fails saying that it cannot find the right implicit. Now again, I have a link at the bottom of the slide. Um, if you're new to type classes, maybe you want to have a look. OK, so this is what we did. By using the type class pattern, we defined our tumaprec type class, which has an apply method that takes as a parameter an age list, and it returns a map from string 20. Now, I'm going to show you the implementation for when the head of the age list is an option. Um, so this is, um, this is fine, but the only thing that's a little bit overwhelming is the list of implicits we are using. So what's happening here? Well, we first assume that we have an implicit that knows how to fetch the name of the field, and that's the witness implicit we have from shapeless. We then have an implicit that um, knows how to convert from the type that's inside the option to an age list, and that's the label generic. And then we have two more implicits. We have the one that knows how to recursively convert the tail of the age list, and one that knows how to recursively convert the head of the age list. Now, now that we know uh, what we have, we can easily implement this in just one line. So what's happening here? We use the uh, implicit that knows how to recursively convert the tail, and we pass the tail as a parameter, and that's going to do its own thing. We don't have to worry about that. And now we have a, s a map from string 20. And the string is represented by the name of the field. So we can use the witness implicit we have and fetch the name of the field. Now, in case of the value, we take the head of the age list. We map over it, because in case it is a nun, we want to keep the nun. But in case there is something um, in there, we want to take the element, convert it to an age list. As you can see there, we're doing gen.2. Um, on the element, and then pass that as an argument to the implicit that knows how to recursively convert the head. And this works nicely. Um, by just defining um, another implicit class, you can call it like that, and the result is quite nice. Um, cool. So now that oops, sorry. So now that we know how to go from a case class to a map, we also have to go back. Um, so this is just is just mirroring the previous implementation. Um, so we have our type class called from map, and then our function this time takes a map from string 20 and returns an option of an age list. Now the meaning of the option is if the conversion was successful, then return a sum and then the result. But if it failed, just return a none. Now I'm not going into detail of how this actually works. Um, but the thing is, this was far from perfect, right? I mean, because of the use of any, we didn't have any type safety. We didn't have any mechanism in place to prevent us from replacing, let's say, a string with an int. And by doing that, you would just make the conversion fail and return a none. But nevertheless, we're kind, kind of excited about this. So we decided to give it a go. So. What happened in the end is we had this very beautiful PR with this implementation in place. Everything was kind of working. Um, but as sometimes happens, my work caught the attention of other teams. And someone came over and said, you know, your implementation looks a lot like what Cersei is doing behind the scenes. So in case you don't know, Cersei is yet another JSON library for Scala. And it looks um, very powerful. And it had this feature that did exactly what we wanted. So long story short, I closed the shapeless PR. I rewrote everything in 
one hour or so using Cersei. Um, so there is an important lesson we've all learned from this. New and shiny is fun. And it's really easy to get distracted and reinvent the wheel in two weeks using cool libraries. Um, <laughs> but it was definitely not a waste of time. I, I might not be a sh an expert in Shapeless now, but now I know a little bit more. And next time I'm going to use it, I'm going to be better at making decisions, right? Um, <laughs> and you, if you end up doing something similar, just make the most out of it. And make sure you share your learnings with the rest of us. Now, I've added links to the Shapeless book I've been using. And I've pulled out all the code from our project, this repo, if you want to have a look. I definitely encourage you to look at this. It's a very good exercise. Um, and who knows, maybe it will inspire you to build something as well. And if you have any questions, um, you now know where to find me. Thank you. Cersei, um, um, I can, you can come over and I will. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you very much.